Good morning, everyone. Well, today's podcast um, is the last in the series for a while about grief and loss. All right. Next month, we're going to do a whole month um, of trauma, however you define trauma, the effects of trauma. Um, I pulled together with the help of some experts, some really great information. Um, and I want to offer it to you because trauma, um, even when it isn't the conventional form, it's about the effect on you. And also the period in your life, the time in your life, developmentally, when it would have um, specifically more detrimental effect on you, all right, and might linger, um, often does linger kind of in the wings. So let's get started today. Loss, as we all know, um, that's why everybody's here, is a fact of life. All right. So are the feelings that come along with grief and loss. And they are what they are individually to each one of us. And our feelings depend on, keep this in mind, not just the reality of the loss, but our state of mind and our state of mental health at the time the loss occurs, which is a very strong argument for protecting and supporting the best mental health that we can fight for at any point in time and reaching out for the help we need earlier than later once it's got a hold on you, all right? Another influencer on the profoundness, the level of grief and loss is the relationship we had with the person. Now, relationships can be extremely close and rich and so we we really miss the person however they can also be complex and confusing and ambivalent that person you, we can have an ambivalent relationship to that person as well with at the moment that the loss occurs unresolved conflict unresolved ambivalence all right keep in mind that this also is true. Grief and loss is not just one big entity. It, it is defined and it has characteristics specific to the certain chapters of grief and loss. And some are more difficult. All right. Why? Why would some be more difficult? It's the same person. It's the same loss. It's because we usually are still dependent on the physical presence of the other person. And when we can't connect visually or tactilely, that can make us kind of confounded about how to process things, our own feeling and whatever the residual effect of that loss is. And it can leave us feeling helpless. If that drags on long enough, it can leave us feeling hopeless and alone and vulnerable. And as if that wasn't enough, all right, added to those facts, there's another barrier. And we've talked about that. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it today. But just to remind you, our cultural approach to grief and loss does not normally support a more spiritual versus religious approach when guiding us. Mostly there are rules and expectations and guidelines that are formalized, all right, as opposed to what we talked about last week with Sean. And because there is a culture around grief and loss with a lot of misinformation, all right. For that reason, last week, I invited Sean Leonard, the Indigenous uh, medium, spirit talker, to join our podcast. Why? So that he could share firsthand with you his personal experience through a very clearly, profoundly gift, profound gift that he very clearly has. All right. And I would love to have your feedback in the chat box today. Like, 
I really would love to hear. Um, and if we get through the material uh, fast enough, I would like to open up the mics and talk about it. But if, if you leave um, a, a message in the chat box about what your experience was listening to him, could you please indicate if I can use that uh, feedback or that comment or whatever it is as a testimonial? All right, I'll protect your identity. Um, and I would like to post them on hoarding.ca um, because I would, with this podcast, I would like others who see medium, what has that got to do with hoarding? What has that got to do with clutter? I would like them to put two and two together through your firsthand um, experience and feedback. Oh, and by the way, this is exciting. Everybody, please, every single one of you, please go to www.hoarding.ca later today after one o'clock Eastern time and see the newly formatted website, right? And please send me your opinions either in the chat, uh, in the contact us section or email me, Elaine dot virtual at hoarding.ca. I would really love to have your comments about the work we do together, um, either through some of the support groups that you may have joined in, or of course, what the podcasts give you and what um, what assistance, what, what the meaning is for you. Um, and again, I'd like, if possible, to use your comments without your identity as testimonials on the website. Okay, so now today's going to be about a slightly different element of grief and loss, all right? And the question I want to pose you is this, are we necessarily doomed to suffer long-term um, grief, long-term loss, long-term pain? Is that part of the bargain of losing someone? And what can we do to help ourselves through this? Because helping ourselves is what we must do. Others will try, but they can't get it right, usually. They certainly can't get it as right as you can get it because no one knows you as well as you. So doing what we can do, not what we feel we can't do, and getting sidelined by that. At the worst moment of I can't, there is always, remember this, all right, remember this, please. There is always some, usually smaller, less uh, significant in impact, there is always a piece of what you can do. Focus on what you can do and work from your strengths, not from fear. Never go to fear. When you feel it, chase it away. Never go to fear. Go to fact. All right. And that will help us continue to move ourselves through these very different phases of grief and loss. And it will allow us to be adequately and remain adequately present for our own life each day as we move forward. I personally believe that love never dies. And not just a cute saying, I really do believe that. And my experience of love never dies is born of the losses I've experienced. Just Truthfully, just about everyone in my life has passed, and I still talk to them regularly. Long before I knew there was a Sean Leonard, long before I knew there was mediumship or anything else, I wasn't really influenced by that. I just thought, how can the power of that energy exchange, how can that die because the person's body dies, right? And true or not, because I can't prove it, I regularly feel them enter my space. Okay, I don't see them. I don't hear them. I don't. It's for me just a sensation that 
they're with me and they remind, especially it's connected for me anyway, of them reminding me of messages that they've already given me in the past. It's a reminder when they were alive that are particularly helpful messages to come to mind in the present, in the here and now. That's how I experience it. And so the question remaining is, how can we, how can you and I keep on relating with ourself and in connection with the loved one we miss? How do we do that, all right, without the mutual exchange of energy that we're so dependent on, we're so used to in our physical form? Megan Devine in It's Okay, You're Not Okay. And in this book, again by Megan Devine, um, whoop, oh, I got that there. All right. How to carry what can't be fixed. Grief and loss can't be fixed, but we do need, we do carry it with us, not as a burden, but as part of the profound experience, okay? So she reminds us that while we must live inside our grief, with our grief, not denying it, not avoiding it, our individual experiences, while they will be unique to us, we will process it in our own way, all right? Everybody grieves differently, but the interesting thing is that when you look at that at a population level, those individual experiences, there are a great many similarities with others who grieve as well. And our peace, our internal peace, not forgetting the person, not going back to a pre-existing normal, that's not going to happen in my experience, all right? That peace that we find can start to return by us being willing to entertain the possibility. Just, it starts here. Just entertain the possibility that the way we think about our loved one's departure and the meaning that we apply to it must change as well, all right? And so as we live with our grief, and the loss that's attached, we will go through many transitions as time passes. Our goal, write this down because you won't remember it in the storm of grief, immediate grief and loss. Our goal needs to be to allow ourselves to remember as vibrantly as possible those who we miss even those we have an unresolved relationship with that are kind of ambivalent. Okay, hanging in for ourself, with ourself, with the love we shared, with the relationship we shared, hanging in as we process the pain and the richness of remembering, all right? That richness, richness rather, of remembering can cause little tweaks of pain, little waves of pain, all right? I remember when Nancy, my sister, my younger sister, died about a year ago. The biggest fear that I had as I tried to stay afloat in the rampant grief I felt was that I would forget her voice. Instead. Instead of getting a car, I, I was tempted, but I thought, no, you're not going to go back to a tangible thing. That's, that's not true. That is a copy of her voice. That is not her voice actually speaking to you. And I will accept no substitutes. I will fight for what I need. All right, because that is probably the almost certainly, the only thing, and I invite you to do the same thing, the only thing that's really going to hit the mark and help you healthily move forward is accept no substitutes. What do you need? 
Where is it? And how do you get enough of it to make enough of a difference? And this example for me was about, I decided instead that I was tempted, all right? With tears in my eyes, I was tempted. Where is that voicemail message, all right? I decided to trust that if I made the effort to bring her voice to my mind richly in the immediacy of losing her when it was fresh, over and over and over and over, I took a moment aside and I retrieved it while it was a rich, relatively new experience that was well within my memory banks. Okay, I did a workout basically in my mind, all right? that I could keep the loving effect of her voice present as well. And if I, right now, even now, more than a year later, if I and when I can shut out the chatter of my mind, all right, and we all have chatter in our mind, okay, and make myself focus I've been able to retain the memory of something that is so important to me about her. All right. And that is, do I actually hear it? No. Does it register? No. It's, it's become a quiet thing that is present if I close out the, the chatter and I make myself focus. All right. If we're willing to give ourselves permission each and every one of us in the losses we have by opening our mind to a new and novel way to healthily, healthily, all right, reduce that suffering. So healthy in my mind is this thing doesn't cost me more than it gives me. There is a balance to it. It was worth the effort. I could have kept a, a gazillion things about Nancy. All right. None of those are Nancy. So you need to figure out in your grief and loss what, and it doesn't have to be about a person. It could be about health. It could be about relationships. It could be about careers. It could be about anything. All right. What? are the most important components of that loss that if you had the ability to track it when you need it most, all right, what would you have to do? What would you have to do? And remember, don't tell me you can't because even as you can't, there is always something and you know the truth you know the truth about yourself and what you need. So don't say I need this, but I can't have it. No. What tiny piece of that step forward to what you actually need can you do right now? And sometimes it starts with shutting out what is interfering. That's what I had to do. I tried to remember Nancy's voice. Couldn't remember it over the chatter. And well, you got to be here by this time. You got to do that. Don't forget this. Blah, 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 blah. You know, the chatter of your day. All right. I have to just shut that out. It's effort. And I had to practice it. All right. Because my day involves a lot of chatter, a lot of deadlines, a lot of whatever. Okay. What can you do? Now, by opening our minds to new and novel ways to healthily reduce the suffering, all right, the suffering would have been that I give in to the fear I will lose her voice and not be able to remember it, never hear it again, and do it with no expectation, all right, no expectation that we can successfully eliminate all suffering. That's not realistic. That is not a realistic goal. This is not a cure-all. This is like an antidote, all right? This is like an antidote. We're putting something healthy, happy, loving, positive on the other side of the scale. This is still, the loss is still on this side of the scale, all right? But by allowing ourselves ways to not let 
that suffering, that immense pain hang around as an enduring fact of our life, right? And there's nothing special about me. I believe that each and every one of us, if we make the effort, can over time reduce our suffering and keep that person or that thing we miss present. All right, albeit in a different form. All right. So, how can we change things enough? Well, as we've already spoken of, we need to allow ourselves permission, all right, to not handle our responses like we're in some kind of test timeline test by this time you should be to this level by this time and if you're not if you ever break that barrier that's permeable and you end up back in profound grief but there's something wrong with you all right all right there's no test a timeline influenced remember that that timeline in is influenced and dictated by outside expectations and most of those expectations are around productivity and what's good for everybody else around us the jobs we have to return to the tasks and the deadlines other people's expectations having to listen to you know endless platitudes uh, well-meaningly given but don't it, they're not answering those three questions. They are not what you need. All right. They are not presented in a way that is helpful. And it gives you something to resist and feel badly about. All right. And sometimes we add our own internal pressures, our own impatience with ourselves. And yes, we may still have those pressures, even though, you know, once you've read the book or gone to the library and got the book or listened to the podcast over, you say, you know, that makes sense. There may still be a temptation to give into it. We must allow ourselves to opt to do old activities, things we've done before, but now without the departed one or the departed loss. How are we going to do that? All right. How are we going to socialize? How are we going to grocery shop? How are we going to stand up and have pride and self-respect when we feel that we're vulnerable? We feel that we're less if it's a loss of, of something that affected, you know, your lifestyle or um, the things you have to count on. How are we going to do that? I'll tell you how we're going to do it. We're going to do it differently. Right. Be aware that in that storm of inbound feelings around whatever the loss is, how we do it differently will depend on the time frame that we're in while grieving whatever the loss. And in the beginning, all right, the initial reality of grief or any loss is generally profound and it doesn't matter whether it's your your parent your best friend your partner your your pet your job if you lose it there is a profound level of grief and shock all right it's normal that it's disruptive it is normal that for periods of time it almost occupies you and holds you hostage okay it's true that even when we start to get more of a handle on it and we can participate more in our day-to-day -day life sometimes it just comes in like waves crashing through us that's normal that's not a setback and the unfortunate part is as it crashes through us it's generally at its will not our will all right, it can be highly inconvenient to have to leave the grocery cart because you're barely able to hold yourself together. All right, all right. But understanding and accepting, understand it, accept it. Don't apologize to yourself or anybody else. Don't make excuses for it. It is what it is. 
understanding and accepting that those things are normal, they are going to happen. That's our first piece of work. And at the same time, let's not kid ourselves. Right? There is nothing normal. There is nothing normal about new grief, no matter what it's about. As time moves on, we will, of course, need some relief from it, some repose from it, where we can gather ourselves. All right. And at that time, sometimes another challenge comes in. I've had this, I'm sure many of you have had it. And that's the temptation to allow ourselves to stay stuck and occupied by it, just to feel disoriented, okay? So giving ourselves permission, as we begin to feel a little better, it's okay to take a time out from the intensity of whatever that grief is. And I encourage you, when you feel that, all right, give yourself permission to compartmentalize for a half an hour a day. I, when those feelings come, I'm just going to chase them away. I'm going to distract myself. I'm going to do something else. You know, you could do something spiritual like meditate. You could do something physical like yoga. You could go for a walk with your dog. You could go for a walk with your neighbor. You could have a hot bath. You could my my favorite was I was never cleaner ever. I don't think in my whole life I've ever been cleaner because every time a wave would hit me, I would excuse myself as quickly as I could. And I'd go and stand in the shower with hot water pouring over me. And I would imagine it the water just melting it off of me going down the drain. All right. What do you need? What works for you? I'm a water baby. Hot water will always work. All right. My biggest fear is that the hot water will run out before the effect <laughs> has arrived. Okay. The other thing too is allow ourselves distractions by being part keeping those contacts alive, maybe not active, but alive. Okay, those things other than grief, that can help us to move through the storm as well. That way we haven't cut off ties. Now, I wouldn't pay a price for that. I wouldn't pay a price for a lot of cheap advice. I would just say what I need right now is let's talk about something other than that. Let's talk about no, I don't really want to talk about how I feel. Um, I want to talk about, you tell me about your life and what's going on in your life. All right, that way, what I, I mean, I'm not saying this to the person, but that way I feel that we are connected and I can be distracted by your life rather than having to process my life. All right, all right. And one of the other things too, when it's especially important when you feel whatever the grief or the loss controlling you, that when you decide to take a time out to compartmentalize for, you know, at, from one till two every day, that's non-grief time. That's something else time. And if you find that that is too strong a fight, then reach out for the support you need. You know the three questions. And you know, every single one of you here knows the truth about what you need. There may be a variety of things you need. Where is it? And how do you get enough of it to make enough of a difference? All right. So to start making those adjustments, why do we need to do that? Goes right back to what I said right out of the gate. And that is we need to preserve an adequately healthy level of mental health, all right? And when we take those um, little reposes or those little time out, another feeling, another feeling can come up, all right? Has anybody here, thumbs up if this has ever happened to you, you start to feel guilty, all right? 
um, about taking time out. You start to feel a little guilty about, I'm not feeling it as badly. Or today, this part of the day was actually a good day. I laughed. I thank you, Dawn. Thank you. Um, Dawn and I apparently are the only ones who've ever experienced that. And Alina, yeah, thank you. Okay, I thought I was the only one. Um, that guilt, there's nothing wrong, okay? There's nothing wrong when your feelings start to mix. And there are little moments. Uh, something makes you laugh, all right? Putting all of the platitudes aside, all right? How can we actually begin in a healthy way to get back to our day-to-day -day life experiences? How can we start? We do it one at a time. And not this is not a linear process, all right? And we try as best we can to make those enriching experiences as well rather than okay well I've got to I don't know do something I've got to for me it would be garden I've got to weed um, it's tolerating the day-to-day -day things turning those into um, chores as opposed to something that we used to actually enjoy right even including pleasurable exciting and interesting opportunities all right be very careful if a little wisp of guilt comes, oh, you know, how can I be enjoying myself? This is true. This is still true. Just realize while the grief and the loss is true, so is the fact that this made you laugh and that you're capable, all right? And not to allow the reality of grief to define us. I'm grieving and so I must grieve. Okay, 24-7, I must grieve. All right. So you're not turning your back on the loved one. You're not moving away from them or forgetting. And you certainly, even when these little episodes of relief happen, or when you go in search of them because you know you need them, you're not minimizing the value you're putting, you're placing on the person or the thing you miss. It's not another loss. This, okay, I'm moving past and somehow I'm losing my association or my responsibility, all right, to this person. It is a necessary additional skill and capability that you need in order to return to your different always it will be changed it's not the old normal all right you bring that person with you you bring that experience with you all right and and it is just another skill because just as we had to learn to walk independently eat independently as babes all right we also need to learn to independently administer self-care as needed because we are the only one who feels the alarm bell okay it's the very same thing okay we're doing the same thing and do it with respect for yourself respect for whatever the cause of the loss is compassion for both and patience patience with yourself all right it's going to help you navigate through a healthy experience of profound grief and loss. All right. And it's important that you get through it in one piece because unresolved grief is one of the most destructive emotions that we have. All right. It's okay to believe, to have faith in the knowledge that there will come a time in future where remembering will make us smile, not cause us that stab of pain. Now, Megan Devine cautions us that the subtle shifts in how we feel are just what they are. Well, here we are, just what they are. 
Okay. And it's okay. So in how to carry what can't be fixed, she suggests, and I'm going to borrow from her because I am not a grief and loss specialist. All right. And I brought a lot of material from a lot of different sources here, well-proven sources to add to why getting overwhelmed or sidetracked or getting caught up in the obligation, the necessity of, of sentimental saving, all right, how that can add to um, clutter to the point that you're in a hoarded environment and living unsafe mentally, physically, emotionally, all right? This is all connected. So here are some ways to figure out, are you stuck? Are you stuck? Suffering, which is not what we want, all right? Not what, what we really need to guard ourselves against persistent suffering might manifest itself, continue to manifest itself in poor sleep, no appetite, an excessive appetite, nightmares. If any of these strike a chord with you, write them down. You don't need the whole list, just the ones you're feeling. Intrusive thoughts that disrupt you, nightmares, anxiety. You can't quite put a finger on what it is. Do you just feel the storm inside? Self-judgment, emotional reactivity. And self-judgment would be, I'm obliged to feel pain when I think of the, the loss. I'm obliged or what, or I'm being disloyal or there's something wrong with me. I'm not appropriate if I don't feel the pain of the loss. That's not, okay. If you bled every ounce of blood you've got in your body, all right? It wouldn't mean you cared more. More suffering does not mean you cared more. It means you're losing control of your thermostat, your mental health thermostat when you let it persist. Emotional reactivity. Either you shut down or you go off like a, like a rocket. Short temper. Sense of guilt disproportionate to the actual responsibility you have for something. Now, in Megan Devine's book, her example is pretty darn profound. She and her partner, um, her life partner, were out um, at a lake. And she was, I think, on the shore at that point. And he capsized his boat and drowned. All right. And so you can imagine. Um, even though those two things, somebody being on the shore there and somebody being in the water are not connected. All right. You can imagine the temptation um, to allow guilt to be the predominant uh, emotion that would persist. What's persisting for you? I, I told you that so you could realize some people have some really, 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 really profound things to get their head around. All right. What's persisting for you? What's hanging on? That's what I want you to focus on. Inability to breathe through intense emotion or to compartmentalize the intensity in order to care for yourself. Do you get caught up in the intensity? feeling victimized by your own pain and also by the responses of others. Now, some people can be pretty trite. That's true. Assume goodwill, which does not mean tolerate cheap advice. Advice is one thing. People have platitudes, all right? They don't know what to say. And in the end, they want to say something that helps. And in, in that effort, sometimes they really put their foot in it, all right? A sense your own pain is too large, can't be contained, and you're not going to survive. Pain with respite periods where calm can manifest itself. Are you feeling any of these things? These are indicators that you're able to fight for that 
I need a time out here. I need, I need a little pull myself together, regroup. Okay. Emotional evenness, the ability for you to be kind to yourself. The sense of being held or companioned inside your pain. So you're with someone and you can allow what they're offering you, if it's appropriate, all right, to actually mitigate the pain. You can feel like you are connected to another person. You're not out there alone, lost in the desert. The ability to feel that what you're feeling and experience has been validated. Incrementally feeling just a little bit more rested. Eating enough for what your physical needs are because you can't eat enough for your or drink enough or take enough medication, all right, for your emotional needs. Fe the feelings of acceptance of your emotional state that, that others, some others, there are others who get it. They understand it. The ability to respond to others' poor behavior by clearly either redirecting them, give them a job, or by some form of boundary and limit. So you protect the authenticness of what you're feeling. All right. Taking things less personally. Everything doesn't feel like it's happening to you. And when things do happen, the ability to compartmentalize intense emotions or remove yourself from the situation. All right. Remember what I've said many, many times. This isn't Megan talking now. This is me. Okay. Be very, very careful what you say to yourself, because that is the meaning you will apply to the grief and loss. And so it's also true and an easy way to undermine yourself, to stay in the intensity and not to correct when you hear yourself. One of the things I do too, when I'm trying to work something out is I say it out, I talk out loud to myself because then I can hear it. And I can hear when, really, Elaine? Really? That's, no, whatever it is, that's not the whole story. There's something else as well. Now, I suggest you don't do it on a city bus or in the grocery store, all right? The men in the little white coats will come for you. But do add another, another way to perceive and to factor out, to hear yourself processing it. Maybe you write it out. I guess I'm more auditory, all right? But be vigilant about your thoughts. Make sure that you're telling yourself as close to the truth about whatever it is, all right, as you're able to figure out, all right, because that's the way not to be impatient with yourself, all right, that's the way to be kindest to yourself and clearest to yourself, all right, you have the right to grieve as you need, in the time you need, or as long as you need, all right? So long as you are not engaging in active self-harm or harm to others, all right? So how do you tell healthy thoughts and approaches from the counterproductive ones? How do you do that? You do it with self-awareness. So ask yourself this, how do your thoughts make you feel? How do they make you feel? What you tell yourself and be guided by the truth, all right, that your mind and your body are trying to heal you. They are always trying to heal you in the best way they can figure out. So if your thoughts make you feel worse, that's not helpful. That is not necessarily lying to yourself or not being truthful. And you know when you're not being truthful to yourself. You get that little, huh? There's just a little hiccup in it. 
you know it. You know it. It does not connect with the dot. All right. So here's what I think. And you go, mm, there's just a moment of not being able to commit to that. It's not helpful to continue telling yourselves, all right, what makes you feel badly, feel worse. Not a good investment also. It will compromise your energy while you're grieving. Grieving is going to be big enough. You don't need to compromise the energy you bring to what is an experience you need to get through, all right? If your thoughts give you comfort or relief or support, even a little, you're probably on a better track, all right? Better track where? To where and what you need, the direction you need to be headed in to come through this period of transition. And now I'd like to offer you a few ideas from Megan's journal. And this is a, a workbook, basically. All right. There are other great workbooks. You can go on Amazon. Um, make, I, I particularly like Megan's because she's quite um, impatient with stupidity. Frankly. And she's quite impatient with the givens of our culture and the habits people, other people have, and the unhelpful support well-meaningly, all right? And it's a really good idea to have a way to kind of shield yourself, all right? Not to have to process feelings of, well, feeling abandoned, misunderstood, unvalidated, like there's something wrong with you. Um, no, you don't need to carry that on top. And so I kind of love She's cheeky about it. Um, and so I offer that just as my testimonial, all right? She stands up to nonsense, all right? So the book is called How to Carry What Can't Be Fixed. She starts out by showing you how to manage the story. When someone dies, there all or an event happens, a loss happens, there's always a story. She starts out by coaching you how to manage the story around the loss you've experienced. That is really important. As I read that, I thought, whoa, I would not have thought of that. All right. With all the experience I've had, I'm not an expert, but I would not have thought of that. You know why that's so important? Because you're going to be telling that story a hundred times. All right. And if you learn how to manage the story, what to say and not say, that's a big help. Next, she talks a little bit about the fact that when we're thrown into experiences of grief and loss, which let's face it, this is somewhere we don't want to be, we didn't sign up for, we just as soon we weren't enlisted, all right? And we can't undo it. If we don't treat ourselves gently, if we just allow the storm to wash us out to sea, if we can't treat ourselves with compassion, gentle acceptance for what we actually are feeling, there's a tendency to deny and avoid the truth of what has happened. It's kind of a corollary. It's an added piece that kind of goes along with that turf, all right? And how it's actually affecting us and impacting our life. It is so enormous, it feels like it's taken us over. But the truth is, it hasn't really. It is a huge chunk when it's fresh, all right? But there's something to be rethought and reworked if it stays, if thinking about it stays that impactful, all right? The timing of how that proceeds, that's up to you. But if you start feeling like, boy, you know what? I can't get out of this. I can't get out of this. And I feel a little need to be able to do and think other things and feel other things. If it just puts a blanket, you know, a cold, heavy blanket on your feelings and you can't really feel anything, don't let that go on for too long. She strongly recommends and guides people to embrace 
acceptance. I embrace, I encourage you to embrace the truth and acceptance, but I also encourage you, I ask you to keep an eye on how long it's going on and how impermeable the grief and loss remains because even though we all go through it in our own way at our own time, it should become, there should be periods where we can permeate through the barrier, through that cloud of it, all right? She talks about the kind of help and, the, and a variety of ways that help can be offered and that we can safely and authentically accept help and the fact that no matter how we choose or allow ourselves to transition through all of these different stages, there are times when it is still going to hurt, all right? There's no painless way to manage grief and loss, but it doesn't have to be a profound, negative suffering, all right, that we carry with us. She also talks about the need for rest and what she calls restoration, which is a great word. All right. When you restore a building, when you restore a something, it's not the same as it was. It's different. And we will be different as we come out of this. All right. Through it. Not out. We're never really out of it. Um, but the not being out of it doesn't mean you're suffering. Okay, and how to use distraction as a healthy and helpful tool. All right, don't just allow it. How to actually use it, squeeze what we need when we need it and the amount we need of it. All right, she talks about the reality of anger. All right, anybody here had a loss and been angry? Please, if every thumb on my board doesn't go up, then you guys are sleeping. Really? Three? Four? Okay, that's a little more like it. Come on, people. All right. Of course, when you didn't sign up for it, of course, anger happens. It does happen. Sometimes it happens involuntarily. Whoops. And remember this. Sometimes it can feel good to feel angry or be angry or react angrily. It can. You know why? Because anger can be a mobilizing emotion, but it can also be mobilizing, which is good, but it can also be counterproductive. Use it cautiously. Allow it to be present cautiously and appropriately. All right. She talks about our reluctance to sometimes want to be normal again. Like somehow that means we're turning our back on the person. Why? Because it might mean in our mind, maybe we give it the meaning that that must mean we're leaving the person behind. And how a better way um, of moving forward to restore ourselves might be to accept that we will transition right out of the gate right in the beginning when it's profound to recognize this is all consuming, all right? But we will transition. We will transition. And if we're not transitioning, according to that little barometer we each carry inside ourselves of what is good and normal for us, then we get help. But we will never, okay, be that old normal again. We will have grown. We will have experienced something profound. And we will be changed by it. All right. Maybe it makes us more compassionate. Maybe it, it opens a door where we can be more accepting of other people and their imperfections. And the fact that everybody is entitled um, so long as they are not deliberately hurting themselves or deliberately hurting someone else, everyone is entitled to make the sense of things that they can see possible for them. 
She also coaches us, as she says, okay, to sidestep. This was a great chapter. I loved it. To how to sidestep bad support. All right. Okay, because what you don't need is to carry on your back at the same time you're trying to manage this landmine, all right, of grief. You don't need to be carrying somebody else's well-intentioned, frankly useless platitudes or bad kind of support. And how to manage and sort out friends and allies when we ask for support and help, how to recognize Yes, this is good support. Sometimes, you know what? The message isn't always welcomed, but you know it. You know that there's a wisdom to it. You know that there's a truth to it. How do you figure that out? Okay, when your brain is in a storm, she ends with coaching us on how to give ourselves permission. Here's a biggie. Write this one down. How to give ourselves permission to have the freedom to live again, no matter what type of loss we're talking about. She helps you, coaches you on how to give yourself permission to have the freedom to live again. And while it may not always be our grief that makes us feel acutely heavy, our grief like our love, all right? Both parts, love never dies. The con in talking to Sean, the contact with the other is possible, all right? And it will always be a part of us. We never really lose them. And that even though we are forever changed, our life can be and even is likely to be at times a beautiful thing again. Stay awake and listening and aware. Don't be looking down at the mountain of grief. But the life we build, we build it alongside the loss. All right. We incorporate the loss, but it's founded on that love that we shared for, for and with our departed. All right. The two go hand in hand. She coaches you on how not to seek to erase the pain. Unrealistic. Okay, you're shutting a door on something that's true. And if you accept Sean Leonard's wisdom, you might more fully entertain the possibility, okay, that we can still maintain a relationship with our lost loved one just in a different form and using different skills. Everybody take care, have a great week and we will see you next Wednesday. Okay, bye. And go to the website and see the new website by one o'clock. Mm -hmm.